At this moment in various places around the world, experiments with handing out money for free are ongoing. Ein Grundeinkommen.de, unsere Internetseite. Und daraufhin wird sich, äh, wir werden es im Bild sehen, zeigen, wer denn das nächste Grundeinkommen gewinnt. You get it for free. From people who feel it's time to break the current relationship between work and income. Ich bin reich. New ways must be found to share the world's wealth, simply because in future there won't be enough jobs to go around. Coming up on this episode. Wij zeggen, los die band, hè? inkomen is gegarandeerd. En aan de andere kant zul je zien dat arbeid, welke vorm dat ook aanneemt, betaalde arbeid, vrijwilligerswerk, allerlei vormen, hè, die, die, die zullen dan gelijkwaardig worden. I don't think we need to wait for somebody in Washington DC to decide that this is something that needs to happen or, or uh, Berlin or wherever the seat of your respective government may be. I think these are things we can start to work on just as we are today. This is Backlight. Welcome to Sharing the Wealth. We urgently need to find new ways to combat the growing inequality between rich and poor and to redistribute the wealth. So we decided to look for people who do experiments in pursuit of new solutions to major social problems. These people are like a new species. They can't be labeled as academics, journalists, politicians or activists. They are all of these at once. They don't wait for approval but simply go ahead with small-scale experiments. A young startup entrepreneur from Berlin decided to change his life. He stopped working for his own internet company and now receives a thousand euros a month from its profits. He regards this sum as his basic income. Ich habe überhaupt gar nicht gemerkt, wie viel Druck ich hatte. Ich habe es erst gemerkt, als der Druck weg war. Und ich hatte auf einmal, ich war nie ein kreativer Mensch, ich war, konnte nie besonders gut sprechen. Und auf einmal kann ich das alles, das ist überhaupt kein Problem. Ich habe Ideen, mein Kopf ist voller Ideen, ich schaffe es kaum, sie alle aufzuschreiben. Ich bin wirklich ein neuer Mensch geworden. Es ist echt krass. Ich habe Mut, Dinge zu starten und ich fühle mich so erleichtert und gesundheitlich geht es mir zum Beispiel auch besser. Und dann dachte ich mir, das geht doch anderen vielleicht auch so. Und dann habe ich mir überlegt, dann müssen wir es mal ausprobieren. Also brauchen wir Geld, um es Leuten ein Jahr lang bedingungslos in die Hand zu geben. Und weil ich aber kein Geld hatte, dachte ich, okay, dann machen wir es mit Crowdfunding. Michael is starting up a crowdfunding project and he calls it My Basic Income. The project aims to generate money to give people a basic income for one year. Die Menschen gehen auf meingrundeinkommen.de und danach haben sie die Möglichkeit, entweder Geld zu geben äh, mit äh, verschiedenen Zahlungsanbietern und so viel Geld, wie sie wollen. Und sie können auch am Gewinnspiel teilnehmen und äh, sich für die nächste Verlosung anmelden. Beide Sachen sind unabhängig voneinander. Das ist ganz wichtig, denn es ist keine Lotterie, sondern es ist ein Gewinnspiel. Es ist also, man muss kein Geld geben, um teilnehmen zu können. Das ist natürlich ganz wichtig, denn es ist ja bedingungslos. Und dann kommen alle in einen Lostopf und dann warten wir. Und wenn das Geld zusammen ist, die 12.000 Euro, damit man ein Jahr monatlich Grundeinkommen von 1.000 Euro kriegt, dann wird eine Gewinnerin, ein Gewinner gelost. Wir haben da hinten ein Glücksrad aufgestellt. Ähm, also im Internet haben sich äh, 18.800 Menschen oder so angemeldet, haben eine virtuelle Losnummer per Zufall zugeteilt bekommen. Das sieht man auch alles öffentlich auf meingrundeinkommen.de, unserer Internetseite. Und ich dann kräftig drehen, bitte. Ich Let's bin die Maren Gilzer. Das Experiment ist jetzt in einer spannenden Phase. Wir haben 2014 fünf Grundeinkommen an Menschen verlost, die jetzt jeden Monat schon 1000 Euro kriegen. Und äh, jetzt haben wir uns ein neues Ziel gesetzt, ein großes Ziel. Wir wollen äh, 100 Grundeinkommen äh, finanzieren und dafür haben wir uns zwei Dinge ausgedacht. Einmal ist diese Karte. Ähm, das ist eine Bonuskarte, die man in Geschäften benutzen kann äh, an der Kasse und kann da Punkte sammeln und diese Punkte sind Geld äh, und die ich, dass ich dann einlösen kann. Der Trick ist, alle Menschen benutzen die genau gleiche Karte und damit sammeln alle Menschen auf ein Konto. 
Und ähm, so kommen jeden Tag ca. 50 Euro zusammen, die wieder in das Grundeinkommen fließen. Das Schöne ist, es kostet die Menschen nicht einen Cent mehr und es ist komplett anonym. Und das Gleiche haben wir auch im Internet. Immer wenn man auf einem Online-Shop ist, den man mag, wo man sowieso hingeht, dann erscheint ein Knopf über der Seite und wenn man darauf klickt, dann fließt eine Provision vom Verkauf in den nächsten Grundeinkommenstopf. Und das ist unsere Idee von einer kleinen Konsumsteuer, wie man ja später ein Grundeinkommen auch wahrscheinlich finanzieren würde. Und das führen wir jetzt im Kleinen schon mal ein mit 1 bzw. 5 Prozent pro Einkauf. Und so kamen in den letzten drei Monaten schon über 20.000 Euro zusammen. Aber wer zahlt das dann endgültig? Naja, es zahlen die Unternehmen. Die, die, die machen das sozusagen als Werbung, als, äh, als ähm, Angebot, damit die Kunden ins Geschäft kommen. Aber ich glaube, die Kunden gehen da sowieso hin und können dann zusätzlich noch etwas Gutes tun. This is a completely unconditional basic income for anyone. There are no rules about age or country. Even children can register. The fifth basic income was put up for raffle, and it went to eight-year-old Robin from Baden-Württemberg. After a marathon debate lasting two days, his parents decided to tell him. Ich bin reich. Also wir gehen in Urlaub dafür. Wir bezahlen damit unsere Miete und wir kriegen einmal pro Monat ein Buch. Das Thema Grundeinkommen ist bei uns auf dem Tisch, aber nicht das Geld. Es geht darum, uns jetzt wirklich frei zu machen, ein bisschen frei zu machen und zu sagen, okay, jetzt, und wenn, wenn wir frei sind, lockerer sind, was passiert dann? Das will ich wissen. Und wenn ich mich andauernd verköpfe, wie gesagt, dann, dann bringt das nichts. Und deswegen habe ich das ein bisschen ruhig gestellt und mir ging es einfach gut. Wir häufen das jetzt nicht an oder sonst irgendwas, wir leben damit. Ich habe gedacht, warum nicht, wenn es mir ein Jahr gut geht. Das ist doch verdammt viel. So sieht's ja aus. Was würdest du arbeiten, wenn für dein Einkommen gesorgt wäre? Ich weiß, dass es sehr viel Material gibt, es gibt auch ganz viele Erfahrungen, es gibt Forschung dazu, aber das können andere Leute besser als ich. Ähm, was ich möchte, ist die Geschichten zu erzählen, ich möchte das erlebbar zu machen. Ich möchte keine trockene politische Debatte, es könnte so schön sein, sondern ich möchte, dass man heute was klicken kann, heute Geld geben kann und in einem Monat vielleicht Grundeinkommen er erleben kann. Und dann möchte ich diese Geschichten erzählen. Wir müssen die Gesellschaft verändern, wir müssen die Gesellschaft so umbauen, dass Menschen sich darin wohlfühlen können, und zwar alle Menschen. Und dafür braucht es Sicherheit, dafür braucht es bedingungslose Liebe. Das ist das, was Babys brauchen, wenn sie zur, zur Mutter auf den Arm wollen. Und das können wir ihnen heute natürlich schwer im Erwachsenenalter geben, aber es ist wenigstens ein Anfang, ihnen 1000 Euro monatlich auszuzahlen, damit der Druck raus ist. Damit sie wieder an sich glauben können. Skeptisch, kann ich verstehen. Ich bin ja selbst Vater und ähm, ich sehe viele Parallelen zum Kinderhaben. Ne? Kinder sind dann besonders kooperativ und besonders, ähm, es geht ihnen besonders gut, wenn sie Sicherheit empfinden und die Eltern in der Nähe sind und wenn sie zum Beispiel auch mal weinen können, wenn sie auch mal scheitern können. Ähm, all das, was wir Erwachsenen gar nicht mehr dürfen. Michael's Project My Basic Income now provides eight people with a basic income. But what would happen if you gave an entire community a basic income? Guy Standing is an economist and a strong advocate of basic income. He's involved in several experiments in developing countries and has recently finalized one in India. For 30 years or more, I don't want to reveal the full extent of these dreams, I've always been advocating and supporting moving towards a basic income. And it's very, very rare that any of us ever have the uh, opportunity to put a dream into potential reality. 
6,000 people in India were given a guaranteed basic income for a period of 18 months, unconditionally, individually and paid in cash. The striking thing that we found was improved nutrition and improved health. The level of economic activity increased in all the villages. The level of earned income, that's apart from the basic income, increased significantly more in these villages. We did not provide any skills training. We, we did not provide any uh, guidance because we wanted to see what happens when you're doing a basic income. I think the only way to make progress is that through pilots on a small scale, that if they're successful, they can be built up. Um, we desperately need to find ways of redistributing income because the degree of inequality, whether it's in the Netherlands or it's Britain or in, in India, I mean, is, has become obscene, obscene. All the old forms of redistribution, income tax, social security, don't work in, in a globalized, open economic system. Literally millions of Europeans are living on the edge of unsustainable debt. They're living on the edge of not knowing whether that tomorrow morning or the next day they're going to have the means to pay for their absolute essentials. And, and we've got a situation where that insecurity is corrosive on our mental health, on our relationships, our capacity to function, and, and we're creating a society with the precariat growing, which is becoming dangerous in the sense that it's the, the simmering disquiet and simmering social illnesses that are, are, are building up. And it, it's got to the point now where I think that unless we have reforms towards a more universalistic approach, a rights-based approach, away from means testing, away from behavior testing, away from all these assessment forms that poor many people have to fill in. Unless we can say, ooh, let's wake up and move, some, move to a better direction, then we're going to build up a society where to talk of social solidarity it will become a bad joke. Guy Standing travels all over the world to share his experiences and to find partners who are willing to experiment further at local level. He's been invited to speak in Groningen in order to help develop an experiment with people on welfare. Joop Rubruck and Jan Willem Wennekes are members of MIS, the Community for the Innovation of Economics and Society. It's a group of interested entrepreneurs and scientists from Groningen. They are keen to actually start an experiment in one specific neighborhood of the city of Groningen. Hello. Hi. Mr. Nice Standing. Welcome nice to the Netherlands. Hi. Nice. Welcome nice. to the Netherlands. Hi, guys. Nice What's your name? Joop. Joop? Yeah, Jan Willem. Jan Willem. Nice Let to meet you. take one. Okay. So you it's cold. <laughs> yes. Let's go. <laughs> Typical Dutch weather. Yeah, very Dutch. <laughs> okay. Waiting. And yesterday was a very busy day for me. So you're both from Groningen, right? Yeah, well, uh, I studied here. Oh, okay. And I, uh, I lived there since uh, one year. If I understand it rightly, it's a sort of uh, strong socialist area or yes, yeah, left it is, yeah, area. It has a strong socialist background. The Dutch welfare state was actually one of the most developed welfare states. But the last 20 years, it's really developing into a... The workfare uh, state. Yes. Yeah. The time that you get a, an unemployment benefit is becoming shorter and shorter. Uh, means tests everywhere uh, appear in the system 
and it's a much more dis disciplinary system. It became really a disciplinary right. system. Yeah. Yeah. Setting up a social experiment in the Western world is a complicated matter. The challenge lies in the fact that we have a complex social security system in place. This needs to be dismantled before we can set up a new one. The government sits just completely fast. We believe not that there is a fundamental movement in there. And we say, if you use good sense, then there are a number of ways where you can actually experiment and can experiment and in our eyes actually have valid solutions. And that we are going to do. Wat we bedacht hebben is om kleinschalige experimenten te doen in bijvoorbeeld steden of dorpen of verschillende wijken. Daar zijn we mee bezig. Dat is dan zeg maar een soort van onvoorwaardelijke bijstand bijvoorbeeld. Dus je, voor mensen die al een uitkering hebben. Dus ja, dat of hoeft die niet zoveel die recht, te kosten. Hè? Of dat... mensen die recht zouden hebben ja. op een uitkering, maar die hem nu niet aanvragen vanwege alle regeltjes. Als je die groep mensen zou kunnen uh, vrijstellen van al die uh, dwang, zeg maar, dan zou je ook interessante effecten kunnen gaan meten. A meeting of experts is taking place on this topic in an ancient water tower. Together with Guy Standing, an alderman of the city of Groningen and a few scientists, the experts discuss a proposal for an experiment with unconditional welfare in Groningen. I think if you take a community of 2,000, mm -hmm. then you're going to have a very good experiment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm confident that you would have a, a very good experiment. And then, then you can test the, 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 the effects, both the effects for the individual, effects for the community, a sense of solidarity and types of work. And, and, and those things have, can be studied at a community level. And I think when we set up experiments in Dutch cities, we should not neglect this social dynamic. I think it should be a starting point. There are several districts that have that are low income districts that have a lot of unemployment. In this area of uh, Bayem, there is uh, some uh, area called the Hoogte, which is here, and we have uh, some uh, like the Indian neighborhood. It's here. In the Netherlands, there's been a new uh, law. I mean, you can tell a bit about it maybe, the participation law. And basically it's a sort of decentralization where the local government has more authority or ways to work with this. Local governments are allowed to experiment uh, with the aim of uh, finding better practices, uh, being more efficient, uh, but also um, uh, stimulating people to, to leave benefits and to, to, see, to seek employment. So just to, to summarize, to get clear for myself here, uh, you're, you're saying if you, uh, uh, you take a geographically a bordered area, and you say that well, everybody in that area who is on social assistance is now treated the same way via, yes. uh, for example, unconditional, unconditional uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. assistance, then that would res uh, give interesting results yes. Absolutely. for the yes. sake of research. Absolutely. Yes. We, the scientists, can decide on uh, the, the evaluation of the experiment. Yeah. But uh, f first things first, I think. But it all depends on um, getting clearance of the, the, the politics, politicians. politicians to do the experiments. Uh, uh, when I think about experiments, I, I'm, well, maybe a bit rough, roughly uh, said, I, 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 I don't bother about what politicians tell me what you can and you cannot do. It's also political will and political courage, courage. which is needed. Yeah. And I often say, I'm also chairman of two Rekenkamers, and then I say to the wethouders, in this time of decentralization, you should do also this to Den Haag. I know, I haven't seen them, you know. Because we're not allowed. That, that's what we're not allowed, and I think we should very much look at you, you are never allowed, you are never allowed to change the system if you want to change it. We should look beyond the law. Beautiful love, you're all a mystery. Beautiful love, what have you done to me? Relatie arbeid en inkomen, uh, dat is een oude relatie. Hè? Uh, betaald werk, dat levert inkomen op. Nou, wij denken, en dat zie je ook, dat betaald werk 
en niet voor iedereen uh, toegankelijk is. Dat het ook wisselend zal zijn, dat het flexibel is. Plus het grote probleem is, als je die betaalde arbeid zo centraal stelt... dat allerlei andere vormen van maatschappelijke bijdrage... vrijwilligerswerk, mantelzorg, het opvoeden van je kinderen... het blijft totaal buiten beeld en wordt niet gewaardeerd. Wij zeggen, los die band, hè? inkomen is gegarandeerd... En aan de andere kant zul je zien dat arbeid, welke vorm dat ook aanneemt... betaalde arbeid, vrijwilligerswerk, allerlei vormen... Hè, die, die, die zullen dan gelijkwaardig worden en zullen ook, denk ik, veel meer ruimte krijgen. Als mensen gewoon zelf de keuze mogen maken... zullen ze ook juist die keuze aan datgene koppelen wat ze op dat moment zien... wat nodig is in de samenleving. Dat is veel belangrijker hè, dan altijd maar alles in termen van betaalde arbeid te willen vertalen. Dat is, in feite, dat is in feite het onderliggende probleem. Heel veel dingen die mensen doen worden te weinig gewaardeerd. En wij zeggen, kijk naar de sociale waarde van de bijdrage die mensen leveren uh, en waardeer dat. Niet met geld, want het basisinkomen, dat is gewoon voor iedereen gegeven. Dat is, een, dat is gewoon een recht, een burgerrecht. Uh, iedereen heeft toch recht om gewoon op een normale manier te kunnen leven... en gewoon datgene wat hij nodig heeft... Om, om gelukkig van te kunnen leven... om dat te krijgen. Waarom zouden we dat mensen ontzeggen... de samenleving? Omdat ze geen betaald werk kunnen vinden... moeten ze daar maar voortdurend op wijzen... van de ene vernedering en het gevoel dat ze losers zijn. Dat is toch onzin? De politici kunnen... Uh, ons niet meer garanderen dat iedereen betaald werk heeft. Dat blijkt... Bedoel, elke dag weer. Dus moeten ze dat idee gewoon loslaten. Who are these people living in this kind of insecurity? Guy Standing has come up with a new term for them, the precariat. The word combines precarious with proletariat and represents a growing number of people who live in a state of permanent uncertainty about their social and economic well-being. If you're up here in the income sale and the salariat and, and the elite, you have total security. If you're down in the precariat, you have none. You are desperate. You have no security at all. You have to do what somebody tells you you have to do. So a struggle for the redistribution of security is fundamental to it. Now, for a transformation to happen, the emerging mass class must start to identify itself as that. A sense of recognition. So instead of somebody looking in the mirror in the morning and seeing a failure, seeing an incompetent person, moving from that to looking in the mirror in the morning and saying, wait a minute, I'm one of millions. The structures are creating these circumstances and I belong to a group. I am part of the precariat. Wat ik gewoon zelf nu merk is, op het moment dat ik stress heb over geld, dat ik op een hele andere manier naar de wereld kijk. Dat ik veel wantrouwender ben, dat ik heel snel geneigd ben mensen in een hokje te stoppen. Uh, dat ik gedachten krijg van, ja, ja, jij hebt makkelijk praten met je inkomen, dit of dat. Ja, nee, je, 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 je kijkt met een, met een veel... Eigenlijk hele nare blik naar allerlei mensen om je heen. Terwijl dat natuurlijk uh, uh, niet terecht hoeft te zijn. En, uh, en het natuurlijk veel prettig is als je uit kan gaan van... wat, ik, wat feitelijk denk ik ook zo is. Dat de, de merendeel van de mensen is integer. En, en, en nou, ik denk in grote mate ook gewoon altru altruïstisch... of geneigd om het een beetje leuk met elkaar te hebben. We are trying to crowdfund mm -hmm. for the basic income. For one person? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, not for one person. It's uh, we f uh, we found the idea in uh, Berlin. There's this guy. He uh, he made it for the seventh person to get a basic income. The same idea we want to start now here in Holland. 
and well, Mislap, uh, uh, yeah, well, no, I said I would do it. <laughs> I will be the first candidate. <laughs> okay, so if you so I'll get very rich, Rachel. You get very very rich. What are you going to do with your money? Yeah, this is a strange thing. Uh, I don't think I do very different things. I want to do these things. I do. I'm 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 busy with here, with Tyne in the start. I'm busy with. I'm trying to do something for the free cafe, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel these urge that are the things I have to do. Okay. It's ju just like what you are doing. It's natural to do the f these things you you are now doing. Groningen has a green hub called the Garden in the City. Each Wednesday and Sunday it hosts the free cafe, where free meals are served made from rescued food. Het, het grootste probleem is, denk ik, dat in Nederland de moraal, je moet werken voor je eten, wordt vertaald naar je moet betaald werk hebben voor je eten. Terwijl ik denk, ja, ik werk voor mijn eten, alleen ik krijg het niet betaald. Ik heb jaren gehad dat ik dus heel veel verdiende en uh, dat ik me eigenlijk nooit zorgen maakte over geld. Toen kwam de crisis. Ik ben een aantal vaste klanten verloren. Ik moet mijn geld verdienen voornamelijk met tekst schrijven. Uh, ik ben het gestart omdat ik niet de hele dag achter de computer wil. Dit zijn de dingen die ik heel graag wil doen en die ik ook de moeite waard vind om te doen. Uh, daar is heel moeilijk geld voor te krijgen. Hier op tuin in de stad komen heel veel mensen, uh, er komen ook gewoon mensen die trouwens uh, werken, uh, maar er komen ook heel veel mensen die zitten in een uitkeringssituatie. Hier komen mensen met een psychiatrische achtergrond, hier komen mensen die gewoon overspannen zijn, hier komen mensen die arbeidsongeschikt zijn verklaard, hier komen jonge mensen, hier komen oude mensen. Mensen die hier komen, die kunnen hier werken. Wij zeggen oké, okay, hartstikke mooi, vind je plek, zoek wat je leuk vindt. Uh, de, wij bieden geen enkel perspectief. We hebben ook geen vrijwilligersvergoeding. We willen zeker weten dat wie hier komt, vanuit, komt omdat hij hier zelf iets vindt, iets terugkrijgt. Dat is het enige wat we kunnen bieden. Uh, dus de mensen die hier komen, dat, dat zijn inherent. Dat kan niet anders. Dat zijn inherent ontzettend gemotiveerde mensen. Maar als je hun spreekt en als, dan is de situatie zo dat ze eigenlijk uh, uh, hun leven willen leiden naar hun eigen inzichten en daarin zo min mogelijk last proberen te krijgen van de uitkeringsinstantie die hun het geld overmaakt. En dat is niet omdat ze... Uh, omdat ze fraude plegen of lui zijn of alleen maar van een uitkering willen leven. Dat is omdat er geen banen zijn. How do we deal with the disappearance of job opportunities? Can we create new jobs or must we reinvent ourselves? Michael Boormeyer and his colleague, both from Germany, are in New York to introduce their basic income project overseas. How are you? How are you? That's it. That's it. Yeah. Albert Wenger, born in Germany, is a major startup investor in New York. He's interested in the impact of technology on society and regards the current shift in the meaning of labor as an opportunity to rethink the system. One of the things that self-perpetuates the existing system, the system that just says, well, you have to work in order to make money. Why do you need to make money in order to afford these things? And once you've bought them, you're still not happy, so you have to work more. And so uh, even people who have jobs are on these incredible treadmills where they're working longer hours and more than ever before. So I think it's creating the best way to get away from that is to create an alternative somewhere else. And then people can slowly for themselves decide that that's where they want to be, where, where they'd rather be. Albert Wenger invests in automation. 
Twitter and Kickstarter are a couple of the big names in his portfolio. His TEDx talk on automation and basic income unleashed a lively debate in the investment industry. That's our idea. Um, maybe sometimes I have to switch to German. And um, maybe in this case, um, wir, wir denken viel, wir reflektieren viel. Johannes hat auch mal Philosophie studiert und wir haben so immer ein, das große Bild im Blick. Um, und wir sehen viel, dass um, zwei Welten oft im politischen Aufeinandertreffen. Und das ist einer Seite, also das System und das Individuum. Mhm. Und um, das äh, Individuum sagt ganz oft, das System ist schuld. Ne? Das ist so die, der, der schwarze Block bei den Linken. Da sagt ihr, das böse, mörderische System, wir müssen euch alle hängen. Und das System sagt, du bist das Problem, du bist faul, du gehst mit Grundeinkommen nicht mehr arbeiten. Und beide bauen quasi Hass gegeneinander auf, die Fronten verhärten sich und ähm, es bewegt sich nichts. Und ähm, unser Ziel ist es eigentlich in allen Kämpfen, den Hebel zu finden, den Sweet Spot, äh, wo, die, wo die Schnittstelle ist. Mhm. Und die Frage war, beim Grundeinkommen, wo ist diese, dieser, dieses Interface, mhm. wo treffen die beide aufeinander? Und das war ein Artikel, äh, der, ein zweiseitiger Artikel, der gestern in der Zeit erschienen ist. Und ähm, die haben es ganz gut illustriert. 1000 Euro äh, Überweisung im Monat, das ist es. Das ist der, der Moment beim Grundeinkommen, yeah. wo, wo System auf Mensch quasi direkt trifft. I love the fact that you guys are just doing it. You know, because I think that is sort of the most important thing. It, a, a lot of why we invest in the internet and internet startups is because one of the things that the internet allows you to do is to do things without asking for permission. Yeah. Yeah. So we call it permissionless innovation. So we tend to invest in this idea of permissionless innovation of things that operate on the internet and create kind of new networks uh, that's sort of central to our investing thesis is sort of the creation of new networks whether that's uh, marketplaces like etsy or um crowdfunding like kickstarter and the thing that i've become convinced uh, of is that i think we're sort of at the beginning of a transition that is as profound as going from hunter-gatherers to agriculture and then from agriculture to industrial mm -hmm. society uh, and the thing that i'm most fascinated by is this idea that Before we became agrarians, we in a way lived in a state of abundance. So if you look at the hunter-gatherer societies, they worked like three hours a day and they were pretty happy and they shared everything. Uh, and then it was only th through this agrarian industrial age that we kind of organized everything around the idea of scarcity. And it's scarce and you know you have to work and you have to work hard and harder. Um, and so now, The thing I'm fascinated by is that I think we can get back to a new form of abundance through digital technologies, which is why I think that digital technology, the internet, and this idea of things like basic income are, are yeah. strongly tied together. Dieses Crowdfunding ist echt ganz nett gewesen und wir haben noch relativ viel Geld äh, für deutsche Verhältnisse gehabt. Was waren es? 60.000 mit der Startkampagne und dann haben wir, glaube ich, jetzt. Ja, 60.000 so ungefähr. 70.000 ist das, was mit Crowdfunding zusammenkam. Aber es reicht irgendwie nicht. Ich finde, man muss es skalieren, das muss größer werden. Das ist eigentlich, es war nur ein Testlauf bisher. Und ähm, deswegen ist es uns ganz wichtig, von Anfang an dieses ähm, Grundeinkommen, was wir einnehmen, halt ähm, aus dem Wirtschaftskreislauf herauszuziehen mhm. und quasi unsere Tools zu implementieren. Oder böse gesagt, ähm, wir hacken quasi äh, den Konsum, um, eine, uns ein. ja. um eine Mini-Konsumsteuer zu machen. Und wir haben diese Crowdbar installiert, das war relativ einfach mit einer Kooperation, das ist halt ein Browser-Plugin, was mhm. ähm, einen Affiliate-Link setzt und die, das, das Toolbar erscheint halt in dem Moment, ja. wo du auf dem Shop bist, das heißt keine aktive Werbung, sondern passive Werbung und du kannst quasi entscheiden, ich will jetzt quasi meine Umsatzsteuer dafür abführen. Und die Leute lieben es uns, die reißen uns das aus der Hand, 12.000 Leute haben das installiert und da kommen jeden Tag 200 Euro fürs Grundeinkommen rein. I love that, There, there's several things I love about what you're doing. One is, I love the idea of figuring out how this becomes something that is easily self-sustaining, that scales, that doesn't rely just on people continuing to give money, but that is embedded in people's daily lives. So I think that's really, really critically important. What can I do to help? I mean, I've sent some money, so I, I'm going to <laughs> contribute to one of the basic incomes, but what other things do you think I can do to help? Mm. And, I can send more money too, that's one thing, but what, what are the things you think you most need? Does social innovation belong with governments or can we now suddenly... I think we can innovate, uh, we can have social innovation. 
Crowdfunding, we're investors in Kickstarter. Crowdfunding is a social innovation. It lets artists, uh, creative people, uh, even products be funded uh, in a completely new mechanism, and that's a social innovation. Uh, I would argue that a lot of what's happening with online education is a form of social innovation because it's making education easily accessible, often for free or for very low cost, that previously would have cost thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. That's a form of social innovation. I don't think we need to wait for somebody in Washington, D.C. to decide that this is something that needs to happen, or Berlin or wherever the seat of your respective government may be. I think these are things we can start to work on just as we are today. Because you are busy with digital innovation, do you feel personally responsible? Uh, some people have said, well, you just say this so you can happily invest in automation. Um, but my view is we should happily want to invest in automation as humanity. I'm a believer that automation will provide us with the ability to have vast improvements in productivity, to make a high standard of living available to everybody, to make access to information, free education, free healthcare available to everybody. So I believe in automation. We don't want to somehow clamp down on it. But we have to then address what the consequences for individuals are from that degree of automation. And that, I believe, is best solved by just putting everybody uh, on a safe floor. And that's what kind of a basic income guarantee provides. It provides a floor, a floor that allows people to afford uh, food, shelter, clothing, access to the internet. How do we afford basic income? Well, um, one of the things that technology does is it actually makes everything cheaper. In the US, since the mid-1990s, consumer durables have actually already been getting cheaper. The only thing that's been getting more expensive are services, and within services, it's been primarily education and healthcare. Technology also making those cheaper. But we have, the economy is producing this. It's not a question of, can we afford this? It's just a question of, do we want to afford it? I think it should be very attractive to people on the right who believe in smaller government, who believe in individual self-sufficiency. I also think it should be completely attractive to people historically on the left who believe in redistribution. This is a very overt redistribution, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. Government is already in the business of redistribution. We're just being very coy about it, and I think this is simply saying some people are going to make a lot of money. We will tax them, or some other, we can tax other things that are making money, and we're going to take that money to provide this basic income, this basic enabler for everybody. One of the main reasons why small-scale experiments are not translated into general policies is issues of affordability. How can we redistribute our financial resources? Alaska has a 30-year-old fund built up with oil revenues. All residents of Alaska receive an annual dividend. This turned Alaska from a poor state with major inequality issues into the state with the lowest poverty and inequality statistics in the USA. Every resident of the state of Alaska gets a dividend check, and you have to be here for a calendar year before you are able to apply for a dividend. So this year, I think we got 18. I think $1,800, you know, per, so, you know, times four, it becomes, you know, quite a bit of money. In the past, you know, we've had uh, much smaller checks, might be $800, you know, a check, so, you know, $3,500 or $4,000, so it, it just varies. We have a very varied uh, source of income, and we uh, still do a little bit of commercial fishing. Um, for salmon. We also have a snow removal business when we have snowy winters. And we also have a, a restaurant supply business um, in which we supply restaurants with the type of wood that they use for smoking ovens and things like that. Very seasonal, as is now since we have the warmest winter on record and it's raining in February and we have green grass, there's no snow to plow. So that's been a very, a fairly substantial uh, reduction in what we kind of, you know, roughly, you know, um, 
base our income on for the year. I don't think the dividend is enough or regular enough to be a source of income from the state of Alaska. It coming once a year and at the most being, you know, maybe $2,000, sometimes being only $800. You couldn't depend on that. But as a parent saving for your child's education, if you save whatever you get for 18 years, that's enough to make a difference in a child's life and their future. The Alaskans are very proud of their Alaska Permanent Fund. This revolutionary idea was introduced by Republican Governor Jay Hammond in close cooperation with former Senator Clem Tillian. Oil revenues are deposited in the fund and kept safe for future generations. And Hammond was just a United States Marine fighter pilot in the yeah, Second World no War following. fighting the Japanese Zeros. Oh no, there was he wasn't no a warrior. fear in Hammond. Uh, it's just that he couldn't be rough on people that needed to be rough. Uh. Hey, what's the philosophy behind the fund? The philosophy of it is the resources belong to the people and therefore you should run it like a company. But we are the only land grant state in the United States. We're the only one that were given a hundred million acres to pick anywhere we wanted to pick. And that was what we had to uh, support our government on. In Texas, the oil belongs to the rancher. Here the oil belongs to the people. Now this gray-bearded old guy in a suit, Jay Hammond. Uh, but the thing is that most of the pictures that I had with Jay, uh, you can find them in the historical library and stuff, but remember I had a fire in 1980 and I lost all of everything. When I found out that we were only getting 1% for oil, uh, I set out with uh, a great mixture, and it wasn't one single party. There were Democrats, Republicans, but it was nearly all the young Turks. You know, the socialists wanted it because they believed that everything ought to belong to private, and I don't believe that way. I'm kind of fairly right wing. Uh, uh, but I do believe that in this case where we were given the oil, that I was now the representative of the owners of that oil. So we ended up with 12.5% royalty and up to 20% taxes to pay for the roads and the things that went in it. And uh, we are converting our re non-renewable resource to a renewable. And we have about uh, $50 billion now. Uh, we should have had $480 billion if we'd put everything in. Now, I was involved in forming the permanent fund, which he was supportive of, but what he saw was the next step. How do you disperse it? Here in Alaska, we have a constitution which is set up an investment account funded with a portion of our oil wealth which would spin off dividends. I wanted to create a stock sharing concept and actually give people a share of dividend earning stock per year. To date, we have a program which each year sends a check to each and every Alaskan. It has worked very well. And it, it is also a way of dispersing money without welfare. Do you see a link between the dividend and the basic income guarantee idea? The idea of giving unconditional money to citizens in a way that makes them equal? Not I, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's the socialist dream. I'm not a socialist. So something we did with our dividend checks is we um, used them for building a small schoolhouse on our property here so I could homeschool our girls. Haven't been out here for about a year. I had two girls and um, I homeschooled for 13 years and it was 
really nice to have a separate building. I know a lot of people homeschool in their own home, but because my older daughter was uh, such a artist and liked to do things and we liked to travel, it, the homeschooling seemed like a good choice for us to have the flexibility and to have that extra money, to have that extra space made her education all the better and she's been on the dean's list continually for two years at college, so <laughs> it, paid, it was a good investment. If the dividends are coming in, that's when the museum will have their fundraiser, that's when things kind of happen and it, it, it yes, it comes to the individual, but so many individuals make a community and then it goes back into the community and I think that it's, it's important not just for people who need the basics, but it's also important to the community for the, the income that does come in. We're still building our home. We live in a dry cabin where we haul water and, and it's a pretty rough life and we're building out of pocket. So the money has to come from somewhere and those chunks of change, I may get running water this year. It's on the docket, <laughs> we're hoping. I mean, people spend it however they want. It's uh, a democratic choice, I guess, what you want to do with it. And, uh, I suppose there must be a crab fisherman someplace that drinks it up when he doesn't catch any crab, but I don't know this person. Is it just another form of redistribution? Well, it's obvious. It's a pre-distribution before it gets into the hands of people that are going to distribute for the ordinary political purposes. It gets, um, part of it gets stopped and sent directly to every man, woman, and child in the state. I wouldn't say it was given, it's taken before it gets to the government coffers. It has a really good effect in that it keeps people at least somewhat interested in the operations of government. And any time there's a proposal to uh, get into the permanent fund and spend it to make up for deficits in the state budget, people rise up in defense. And it's been on the ballot a couple of times, and I think the response was, 87% did not want a single penny from the permanent fund to be spent for anything except its already uh, approved purposes, which is not all paying dividends. It, it does other things as well. Dividends, yes, well, it's, uh, as the inventor said, they thought that greed is a legitimate human emotion and that by appealing to people's greed, you could protect this for future generations. It's in the book. So the dividend is this? The dividend is a way to appeal to people's greed? Yes, to protect the fund. So no disrespect to people who need a guaranteed income, but that's really not ex what we were up to deliberately. The Alaskan model has been a beacon of sense in the search for new ideas on distribution. If all the residents of Alaska receive a dividend from oil revenues, shouldn't all South Africans get a dividend from the diamonds and the people of Groningen from the gas?